thank you very much for inviting Deloitte to uh, address you this morning. Um, question I ask is, why is Canada and Alberta in particular rated so low on innovation in, uh, in a recent Conference Board of Canada study? And, uh, and so uh, Deloitte, uh, having seen that uh, publication, thought, um, well, if it's Alberta, uh, is also ranked low in that. Uh, Canada was uh, 12th out of 15 countries. Alberta was uh, fourth among Canadian provinces. With such a roster of amazing talent and geophysicists and geologists, it just begged the question, why, why is Alberta not actually achieving a higher uh, performance ranking in terms of innovation? And so what I'd like to do today is, is at, uh, share with you the results of a survey we carried out with the Canadian oil and gas industry to ask and answer that question. And uh, I'll leave you with a few thoughts around what you might wish to consider undertaking uh, to help improve the, the, the Alberta's uh, innovation index. The survey was carried out um, uh, with the Canadian oil industry and covered fully 65% of Canadian oil and gas production. So it's a fairly representative survey. One could argue that the, all the innovation takes place in the 35% we didn't survey. But if that was true, then we would certainly hope to have seen a much higher score in the index. And, uh, but that's not the case. So we've taken the assumption that uh, the innovation uh, results uh, from our survey um, are, are indeed reflective of what's the situation in Canada and in Alberta. Uh, Portia Meyer is here. Yes, from Australia or... Ah, okay, so I recently came from Australia. I spent the last four years working in Australia with the oil and gas sector there, building the uh, LNG business. Um, Australia has successfully spent $200 billion delivering a $100 billion sector. The mathematicians amongst you will realize that they've overspent on the industry by twice as much as they probably should have. But one of the things the Australians do, which I really admire, is they, uh, they embrace the fact that there's a traditional landowner. Canada does not do this. This helps explain why we have a lot of um, opposition to oil and gas resource development in this country. So I'm going to read for you what it is that the Australians launch every meeting with. It's an important statement. Uh, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and their continuing connection to the land and to the community. And we, we pay our respects to them, their cultures, their elders, past, present, and future. Uh, and Australia does not encounter anything close to the level of opposition to resource development uh, from the ori original peoples of the land. The, the, the activists are all there, the anti-fracking movement is all there. But in terms of uh, community opposition, it's not nearly as extensive as it is here. And now, those of you could probably tell from the picture, and if you see me uh, in person, obviously, if you get the good eyesight, uh, you'll recognize that I'm old. And uh, my uh, younger consultants uh, refer to me as a senior citizen, uh, whereas my other partners call me a senior partner. I prefer the senior partner logo, to be honest. Uh, I won't touch on our oil and gas reality today, but as you can, as it was originally uh, laid out uh, at uh, the opening address, uh, the industry is in a very significant uh, situation. And you know, my years of, of time with the industry, I worked for Imperial Oil for many years, and I've worked for Shell and CNRL and Husky and the pipeline operations and so forth all around the country, and indeed the world. I've not seen a situation like this in my uh, professional career. Um, the uh, challenges facing the industry are as intense as they've ever been, and uh, they're not likely to change. Um, there are many things that we cannot change as an industry. We cannot change the price. Uh, we cannot easily change the um, opposition to industrial activity on the land. We have governments now that are arguably neutral, ambivalent, and indeed hostile to the development of resources. And uh, uh, we are, because of the nature of the resource development over the past uh, uh, 40 years, all of our infrastructure and our activities have been aimed at satisfying a very large market south of the border. The Americans are now exporting all of their hydrocarbons or are attempting to export their hydrocarbons. What this means is that our one and only market, our big market, uh, is becoming less and less appealing to us. And so it behooves us to stare hard at our business model and ask, are we actually on the right track? Um, and uh, uh, one of the, the results of the survey was that we have indeed been very, very good at what, what executives would say is tweaking at the edges of our business model here in Alberta, but we are not actually tackling some of the fundamental challenges that would help us break free from some of these particular challenges that I've outlined here on, this, on the slide. So what did they tell us in the survey? Well, uh, it was uh, unanimous. Innovation is a key imperative. It is no longer a nice to have, nice to do. Uh, the um, 
Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the um, uh, Conference Board of Canada pointed out that uh, without innovation, uh, the country as a whole uh, suffers, but Alberta being such a driver of the economy nationally, when we are not innovating, it has a significant impact on the rest of the country. Some facts from the survey, just to give you some sense of it. And by the way, the survey is available for download. If you want to approach me afterwards with a business card, I will email it to you directly. Otherwise, just go to the Deloitte website. You'll be able to, you'll be able to find it there. 86% of the innovation in Alberta in oil and gas is aimed at what we would call the core of the business. And that is defined as investment in the exact same sets of assets and taking the same sets of product to the same markets. 86%. Only 11% of the innovation uh, effort in Alberta is actually aimed at growing incremental assets uh, or trying to prosecute adjacent markets. So to the, to the point earlier, Mexico uh, being a, a market that's not quite adjacent but close enough. Only 3%, only 3% of the R&D investment in oil and gas in Alberta is aimed at either entirely new products or going after brand new assets or the delivery or, or accessing brand new markets, only 3%. So it's, it's, uh, it, one would argue um, that uh, with such a limited amount of our investment energy going into prosecuting uh, this uh, greater um, opportunity set, uh, that we are not, we are not uh, painting ourselves very well for a, uh, for a future, a, good, a strong future. When we asked in the survey, why do companies innovate? We got all the right answers, of course. We wish to be globally competitive in cost terms. We need to shift the public perception and its negativity towards resource development and, and oil and gas in particular. We wish to turn the oil sands into a sustainable uh, and economically feasible and safe industrial enterprise. And we want to create value across our triple bottom line and uh, make sure we have our social license to operate. So all the words are there. All of the words are there, but it's not backed up by the, the uh, actual um, investment in, uh, in R&D. So when we asked, well, where and how are you innovating? And uh, the bottom line of this is that the executives told us and the survey told us the challenge the industry struggles with is it doesn't have a very good approach for innovating. The industry tends to point its dollars at, very, at point solutions. These point solutions don't really embrace an integrated view of the business. Uh, the dollars tend to be associated with R&D and technical. They tend to be highly concentrated in just two areas. How do I get my resource out of the ground and how I do it more cheaply? And that makes complete sense. If you own the balance sheet and the biggest asset on your balance sheet is your resources and you, want, you wish to be a prudent steward of shareholder value, it behooves you to get the stuff out of the ground as fast as possible into markets and do that at the most economically uh, uh, viable uh, way that you can. Uh, the challenge, though, is that uh, there are many, many, many other avenues of innovation, and uh, this model of investing all of our time and energy into the same narrow, narrowly defined areas is no longer um, able to get us free of the various constraints we have now facing us from around the industry. I use a very good example, a very simple example. In... Um, the supply chain, if you went to an, a typical oil and gas field and you looked at the interface between the operator and the service companies, it would look very much like it's looked for 40 years. If I need a service, I'll call up a supplier, I might get two or three quotes. Um, I'm not sure if his equipment's available, I'm not sure of the quality of his crews and so forth. And uh, I don't really engage or create the kind of industrial um, process that would have that uh, service delivery to the field delivered in the fashion that it gets done in many, many other fields of enterprise. We are, we are, to a degree, not innovating in that dimension of the oil and gas sector. So only 6% of our total R&D dollars, according to the survey, goes into innovation in things that what, what we would call the experience of oil and gas exploration and development. Only 6%. And in that experience is our activists, the stakeholders, the landowners, the First Nations peoples, the communities with which we operate. Only 6% of our energy goes into managing what is becoming a large, very complex, quite sophisticated, socially aware sector that is using those same tools that are available to us to oppose the very actions that we're trying to prosecute for the purposes of creating a better society. So 6%. Not enough. There are 10 areas of innovation that we covered off in the survey to just kind of illustrate where the uh, innovation uh, dollars could go. And I'll just touch on these quickly. Um, the profit model and how we make profit. We haven't changed that, uh, that definition in a very long time. 
the structure of our industry and the businesses that are operating in it, the network within which we operate, limited forms of collaboration and cooperation, for instance, the processes that we use and the product that we extract are the areas where we put most of our dollars. But uh, service, channels, brand, even engagement with our customer is, uh, is, is relatively limited. We, we don't, the oil and gas industry doesn't really even see a customer. Our product goes out into a commodity market. Um, I think it's very instructive that at the Paris Auto Show just this month, um, the, uh, most of the new products on display were electric vehicles and hybrids. So the customer who buys crude oil for the purposes of refining it and getting it into market for transportation are slowly turning their backs on the oil and gas as uh, and 75% of the barrel goes into transportation. If that sector starts to really move away from oil and gas, uh, then it, uh, it does not uh, spell a good long-term future for the, uh, for, the, for the industry. So we need to move beyond um, bright, shiny toys, and we need to invest in uh, other areas and avenues of innovation. Next, we asked in the survey, well, where and how do you fund innovation in your organization? And we, you say that it's important, and uh, you do some investment. Well, obviously, there's investment dollars going into R&D. Uh, where and how is that uh, funded? And what the survey told us is that innovation is largely funded out of the operations budget. Therefore, it's entirely focused on what operations is after. Therefore, those two levers I spoke about earlier, getting it out of the ground as fast as possible and, and doing it as cost effectively as possible. So innovation really becomes OPEX and cost reduction. This is one of the phenomena that the executives pointed out to us. It is driven around those two fundamental uh, drivers. And because it's paid for out of the operations budget, it's subject to the pressures that um, come into operations, i.e. further cost reduction. So that even the R&D and developed budgets associated with innovation get squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. Therefore, there's a structural issue lurking in here. So when we ask the executives what would be one of the handful of things that, that would need to change in order for us to create a different uh, innovation climate, uh, the critical message was uh, we have a structural issue. We're not set up properly um, to do this. It's interesting that in other sectors, uh, the um, other sectors reach out deeply into their supply chain to drive more and more of their innovation. And uh, in oil and gas, that's no different. But as was pointed out earlier in the opening remarks, the pressures on our supply chain, critical suppliers, uh, technology companies, uh, the pressures of the industry have been pushed down onto the supply chain. So now even the supply chain is, is squeezing its ability to innovate. And the consequence is that the uh, bubbling up of innovation and, and change that could uh, help the industry improve uh, is being choked off at the uh, supply chain head. The mining industry has gone through a very, very similar phenomenon. And uh, what they did as a sector was they created uh, what they called um, innovation ecosystems. The mining uh, industries would get together and then help the um, supply sector into mining work with the miners to develop the changes that the industry would need to help the mining industry survive the uh, downturn. And it said, I can tell you, in, having spent four years in Australia, the mining downturn was just as extreme to the, in the Australian economy as oil and gas is to here in Alberta. Uh, it's a very, it's a, uh, mining is fully 20% of Australia's GDP. Oil and gas in Canada is maybe 6%. And when the, so when the uh, iron ore and coal prices collapsed, uh, it created a crisis nationally in Australia that was just as strong and just as heartfelt as it is uh, here in Alberta. So you have to turn to other sectors to look for the um, opportunities uh, and insights into how to um, uh, organize differently um, for the purposes of improving uh, innovation. So physician, cure thyself, industry. This is a challenge to the industry they, they, uh, to cure themselves. We did some additional uh, research to try and understand for those companies that were particularly good at innovation, uh, did they actually get a different economic outcome? If all of, if all companies, uh, if, if companies are undifferentiated through their innovation efforts, then it, it would say, well, there's no much point in innovation, is there? But uh, what we did was we looked at, across the Standard & Poor's 500 index, a small number of companies that the media would widely say are strong innovators. Those that prosecuted five types of innovation across the 10 that I've outlined, just five, uh, th this uh, group includes some 45-odd companies, 
their stock performance is double the S&P 500. So for those organizations that pour some additional money and, and to have a broader view of innovation, uh, their stock performance is dramatically higher. 59 companies looked at, uh, prosecuted three to four different kinds of innovation and uh, their performance against the S&P was 50% uh, better. And a small number of companies, 34 companies, did one or two types of innovation and they're very, very systematic at it and uh, their stock performance was 40% better than the S&P. So there's definitely an economic prize here uh, to go after. And it's the, the lack of metrics and targets and agendas where you just, where oil and gas just point solutions, bits and pieces of innovation here and there, is really robbing the industry from the stock market performance that, would, uh, that these other, other organizations are showing. Now, I'm the first to admit, having spent a lot of time in the industry, the value of an oil and gas company is 70% of it is just based on two variables. What have you got in the ground and what's the price of the product today? 70%. So to be blunt, we're not going to be able to innovate too much and get that kind, this kind of uplift on our stock performance. But it does also say that for those organizations that do create a broader uh, innovation game plan for themselves in the general, in this, in, certainly in the stock market, do get the recognition and they are rewarded for that. When we ask executives, how come you don't, wh wh where and why the, is the debate internally about um, innovation uh, not treated um, with this kind of urgency that we see these other market leading companies? And the answer is typical. Well, we're three years into the downturn. Um, and so we've got other pressing priorities. Um, it's not really the right time for us to innovate. Um, we need to pay our dividends this year. Um, it's very hard for us to think long term when we have to do reserve replacement. So we don't set aside funding for this, uh, these uh, uh, investments. And then there's some very strong cultural views that uh, get in the way. Uh, there's a view in the oil and gas industry that the world will always need oil and gas, so why do we need to innovate? Uh, there's a view that um, outside ideas from other sectors really have no place in oil and gas. And when it comes to things like, you know, using smartphones and tablets on uh, offshore platforms, that's absolutely true. They're not intrinsically safe. But that does not mean that the ideas of Uber have no place in the supply chain. Uh, so this, uh, the notion that certain outside ideas have no place uh, is no, no longer, uh, I think, is no longer uh, plausible. In the mining industry, I, one could argue the exact same thing, and the miners have uh, come up with things like um, uh, Uber for uh, yellow goods in Australia. There's no reason why such a thing could not be uh, considered uh, here. I want to just touch quickly on Moore's Law. Those of you who know Moore's Law is, is that as te certain technologies, once they get onto Moore's Law, they start to double in performance and have in cost every 18 months. And of course, the timeline can stretch and change, as it were. Um, but it's now a, short, short, a kind of shorthand for rapid technology change. Oil and gas is in a foot race against uh, technologies. And arguably, um, yes, we can look at Samsung and the problems they're having with their Galaxy 7 uh, telephone and point at them and go, there you go, unsafe, and this is why Moore's Law doesn't always work. Well, that's true, but the renewables and batteries are coming. And uh, uh, the, the transportation sector looks like it's turning its, its, uh, its attention towards uh, new and alternative forms of fuel and transportation. Uh, and this is not a, as I said, mentioned earlier, this is not a good outlook. ABB, who supply an enormous amount of the automotive industry with parts, and therefore have a very good view as to what their customers are telling them that they need to put into the vehicles for electronics, are of the view that 50% of all car manufacturing by 2030 will be fully electric, 50%. Now, there's 65 million manufacturing unit capacity globally in automotive today, 30, uh, so that's 30 million cars. My math would tell me that about 20 million cars electric per year is equivalent to the market oil market imbalance that we've been experiencing that gave rise to this huge price collapse. Uh, so we don't have that far to go before the EV uh, wave starts to chew into market demand for, uh, for product. Um, the uh, Renault uh, announced that they will be phasing diesel out of their uh, vehicle fleet. Today, 50% of the vehicles sold in Europe are diesel flavored. The view is by 2025, it'll be 5%. So the market for diesel is about to shift quite dramatically. And you know, when the derivative products for crude oil start to move around, it has significant effects on the demand for, for crude oil. So what do the good innovators look like? Well, I'll touch on four things that they, uh, they do particularly well. 
And uh, then I'll give you four actions that you, this, this uh, oil and gas companies might wish to consider. So first is, is the overall approach. Oil and gas companies, generally speaking, do not structure themselves and create a, an approach to innovation. It's not something that is uh, thought through with um, the way we would typically approach a capital program with phases and activities and work plans and structure. We just, we, we, it's much more like skunk works. So first thing to change is the approach. You have to get that right. Second is we have to have an organization unit to house innovation. Leaving it to, to sort of grow and foster in uh, the full, full across Oregon oil and gas without giving it an organizational home isn't working. The results that we've got today don't work. So the organizational approach needs to change. We need leadership, we need teams, and, and uh, a place for uh, innovation to, to take home. Third is the resources. By not applying and, and having the resource mix to go after innovation in a systemic way, uh, we get um, inconsistent results. So here we need the, the teams with the tools and the skills and the rights and the privileges to go out and, and innovate across the, uh, the, the business model. And fourth thing that we don't have is the targets and the metrics. The oil and gas does not, unlike a Google or an Amazon or other uh, highly innovative organizations, oil and gas sets its targets and metrics just around the two things it does get the resource out of the ground and do it cheaply. Whereas other organizations set broader metrics for embracing and changing the relationship with their stakeholders, embracing the, chain, the relationship with their supply chain and their channels and so forth. So a different set of metrics and incentives is required. This is my final and call for action. So if there's something that you can take back to your, your organizations from this presentation, these are my three thoughts. There is because of the changes that are going on in, around us with uh, innovative technologies, the art of the possible is now dramatically different than what I would have uh, is sort of expressed in, or seen within my earlier days in my career. It is dramatically different. And so exploring the art of the possible becomes a, a, a very, very important uh, and critical element for oil and gas. Next is no one knows how the future is going to unfold. There's any number of possible scenarios. You only have to look south of the border and think Trump, Hillary, what's the future gonna look like? It'll look very different depending on what happens down south. So you need to experiment with future scenarios and just ask how could the world be different and therefore what should my innovation agenda look like? And third and finally is a call to action to become the serial innovator. Oil and gas is innovating today on two of 10 variables and it's not delivering the results. Oil and gas needs to start to think about how do I innovate on three or four variables, just three or four. That's good enough to give you a 30 to 40% stock price boost and a, and a better opportunity in the, uh, in the international marketplace. With that, I'll conclude and just invite you to download a copy of the presentation if you wish. And if I'll be here for the uh, duration of the morning and most part, hopefully the afternoon. If you wish to get a copy of it uh, directly, come see me and I will email you. Uh, that's it. And, he, and I assume there's a moment or two for a question and that's about it. Thank you so much. You have been listening to a podcast from digitaloilgas.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to future installments and visit us at digitaloilgas.com.